this week. Well, just this Sunday. He'll be back Wednesday. But he has handed the pulpit over to our own brother, Jay Ruiz. And just to speak some kind words about Jay, he is an excellent minister of the word. He has a podcast called Our Father's Heart, which it truly is a blessing to me and my wife's life, especially in our walk with God. And I'm just amazed. I'm just amazed at um, how the Lord has really worked in our own body and just what we have here to offer. Brother Jay is an excellent teacher. I mean, I'm excited for today. Like worship was fantastic, but I'm excited for the word of God. And so without further ado, Brother Jay, you can come up here. And let's join our faith in partnering with the man of God as he comes to preach the word. Brothers and sisters, I'm humbled. I'm just humbled. You can have a seat. I don't want you standing while you're listening to me. The kids, yes, yes. That's the clarion call right there. So kids, it's time for you to head on out to Sister Anita. She's got a wonderful lesson for you today, a blessing for you. So keep your ears open, pay attention. It's important for you. The Lord is seating in your lives. And he's going to bring about the fruit in due time. Wow. I stepped into this place, listening to the songs that were going to be sung. I was already being touched. So I apologize if I can't quite get a hold of myself. There was a man that sat me down recently. He wanted to address something with me. And I realized it was, it was hard for him. It was hard for him to address whatever topic he wanted to address me with. And the topic wasn't really important because in the end it was really it's no big deal. But as he was sitting down with me, as we were faced across from each other, you know, he was trying to get, he was trying to get the words and he couldn't get the words. So he started with, hear my heart. That's what he said to me, hear my heart. And then it kind of, I wasn't defensive. I didn't, I didn't really know what he wanted to talk to me about. And then when I heard what he said, I'm like, oh, okay. Maybe he thought whatever he was going to say was going to offend me in some way. I don't know. So the Lord reminded me of that. And I want you to hear my father's heart today. That's really what I want. And if I could just get out of the way and let him speak what he's got to say, then this will be a wonderful moment of ministry. There's a scripture in, in Ezekiel 9, 4 that talks about... You know, the Lord said, go through the midst of the city and through the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. And, and I've read that scripture in times past, and I always kind of maybe have made a joke to my wife about, you know, well, the men are sighing and shaking their head and the women are crying and, and, and over all the abominations. And I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm. I'm nearly 50 years young and I feel like I'm getting to the point where I'm starting to cry more. I try to teach as Jesus taught. He used the everyday affairs of life to reveal the kingdom of God and more importantly, the underlying spiritual issues and principles that he was trying to convey to them that, that are, were in the heart and so I start this because I, I want to I start with a macro vision of, of what I see and, and what the Lord's been showing me. And it's, you know, he brought, up, he brought up the podcast. You know, I sat down. Ooh, that's loud. I don't know what's going on with that, my guys, but y'all got to work on that. All right. Um, so I sat down. I spent four hours talking with youth leaders in the meeting place, it was like four hours. Um, and this, 
this teaching kind of just was birthed out of that because there were things that, that we were speaking of that it just, the Lord was guiding me down a path for months. I mean, that, t- that was September 1st. It was Monday, September 1st. And he's just been ministering to me and speaking to me. And something, and then he brought to my mind something that happened that was very significant that happened in this nation. It happened on June 24th, Friday. Anybody know what happened that day? June 24th, Friday of this past year. They overturned Roe v. Wade. And when that happened, I was, I was, I was happy. I mean, I was, I was, I was really, really happy because abortion was legalized in 1973. And if you were a Christian during that time, you've been waiting for that moment. You have been praying. You have been fighting for that moment where the Supreme Court justices would realize the error of their ways. Because I know that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin, it's a shame to it. And they finally turned it around. And I don't know why. I don't know what because of whatever circles I was in. I nearly heard nothing about it. Now, I'm not the one to to watch the news a lot. I know it was on the news. But I'm talking about just in my personal circle. I didn't really hear about it or its significance. And I thought it was incredibly significant. But at the same time that I was happy, I was elated, I was also reserved. Because that's the way I am. You know, when I minister to people and, 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 I, and I minister something that they need to hear, I, I'm, not, I'm not so excited that they heard it and they seem to have received it because I'm stepping back and saying, let's see what he does with it. I'm just like that. So I felt like, what's going to happen with this now? And what happened before this, this date and what happened after this date was why I was so reserved because states in our nation wanted to pass legislation to have abortions in their state since it's all the rights have now been put into the state's hands to have abortions up to the date of birth. And I thought, oh my God, it's finally been changed in the Supreme Court of the land, but now the states and the people want to pass legislation to have abortions up to the date of birth. Many things have happened in this nation over the last several years, and it's reminded me how we Christians are pilgrims and sojourners passing through a world that is at war with itself. And because we're passing through, it's at war with all those that are passing through as well. You know in the scriptures how Jesus talked about in it was Matthew 24. That's right, Matthew 24. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And immediately we think of, oh, this nation is going to rise against this nation. We think of World War I, World War II. We think of the Vietnam War, the Korean War. We think of all of these wars that have happened in all of our history. And I think it may be a little bit more closer to home. One of the things that came up in, in our podcast that I introduced, uh, you know, to, to, to the youth leaders is that there's a five-fold ministry in the world. You know how we have a five-fold ministry in the church? We have the, the, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, the pastor. The world has their own five-fold ministry. It's education. It's music. It's entertainment. It's religion. And the most powerful one, I think, right now is media. You know what media stands for? Most effective devils in America. Because they stir up all of these culture wars that are all around us. They use the technology of our cell phones that, from 9-11, have just proliferated in this 21st century where you... You, you, 
young, old, everybody in between has got a cell phone. That's where they're getting all their information. And they're using that to, to, to advertise to you what they want you to hear, what they want you to see, what they want you to believe. They're using that to corral the masses and steer them in one direction or steer them in another direction. And so when I see, let me be honest with you, when I see parents give their children cell phones at a really young age, I cringe. Oh, in my spirit, I am groaning. Because I know the devastating effects and powerful influence giving them a cell phone at a young age that they cannot handle. You've got MySpace. Well, it started as MySpace. That was years ago. I'm trying to bring it up to our our current day. You had MySpace. You had Facebook. You have Twitter. You have Snapchat. You have Instagram. And the very biggest one of all, There you go. It is the most influential social media technological advancement going right now. By the way, it's owned by the Chinese. Yeah. Oh, and then we got Meta coming. We opened up a parent's doors box in June 25th, 2015. Anybody know what happened that day? June 25th, 2015. It was the Supreme Court. They redefined marriage in our nation. And we are now witnessing all of the fruit of that one decision in our nation because it is proliferated in an exponential rate. All my math teachers in the house, exponentially, it's it's not, it's not like this. No. It's shooting up there. You know that through social media and, 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 and all of the things that we participate on an internet type of level, they're canceling. They're canceling, silencing, and if they can, fire him for what he said, what he did, what he did not do. He put the black square on Facebook. He's okay. Oh, they didn't do that. Get them. Find out where they work and go tell on their boss to get them down. Masculinity is now toxic. Masculinity is now a poison. I, I joke with my kids. A lot of you know I'm a teacher. I joke with my kids because some of them will ask me, hey, can I go to the bathroom? And then another person will ask me, hey, can I go to the bathroom? One of them is a guy, one of them is a girl. They both ask at the same time. And then I say, or, or maybe the guy asks first and, and, and the, the, the girl really needs to go. And I said, well, talk to him. What does he do? He walks right out the door, goes to the bathroom. That's a 21st century guy right there. 20th century, I hold it, go. There's a difference in our, in our, in our 21st century and 20th century. It's vastly different because of what's happened in the first 20 years of our existence. In the last three years, we've had COVID lockdowns. And look at the fruit of what that's done to our kids educationally. Look at the fruit of what it's done to our families. Look at the fruit of, of what it's done that... that How many of you were during the COVID lockdowns were in a particular church and now you're here? Anybody lost that fellowship from before? Now, that may have not been the entire factor. I understand that, but it definitely was a factor. Not meeting, not fellowshipping together in person, doing Zoom calls all the time or go-to meetings. So in the words of Shakespeare, Another issue that's happened recently, to vax or not to vax. Has that not divided us? We see it clearly in the world. You've got this side is like, "Uh uh-uh, I ain't doing that. I know better. And you got the other side saying, you better do that or you're going to kill my grandma. You know what the sad thing is? That I see it in the church or those that call themselves the church. 
and we're divided. And that's exactly what the attack is meant for, to divide us. In the words of Shakespeare, to mask or not to mask. I always tell my brother, you look so handsome without that mask on. I tell him every time I see him. Because he does. But th there were stories during the time, I don't know if you were aware of them, there were stories during the time where you would be, there was a woman without a mask, her child, she was strolling through the, through the, the, the supermarket, it was in the north, and then people started surrounding her. Put your mask on! Put your mask on! Get out of here! You're not going to put your mask on! Get out of here! You're going to kill us all! Right in the middle of a supermarket? She's got her baby right there in the stroller and you're losing your head? Or maybe you saw them in a Walmart, some person without a mask just going shopping, getting some stuff, and then they're trailed by somebody. What are you doing? I'm getting, show, going shopping. Get your mask on. I'm going to get my mask on. Leave me alone. And they, they, they stalk them in the middle of Walmart. All of this that I just mentioned has resulted in a very strong spirit of fear. This spirit of fear is at work, but it's not just in the world. What breaks my heart is that I saw it in the church. They're walking in fear for these last two years, and it's like they forgot what Psalm 91 said. bring up another issue. So there's a celebrity. If you lived in Miami, you would know who I'm talking about. It's a celebrity dad. His son came to him one day. He's got like several sons. And said, I'm actually a girl. And what that dad do? Started allowing him to dress like a girl. To where the latest that I saw, he actually put his own son on the cover dressed with makeup and clothing as a girl. But it's highlighted by the media. This is the thing to do. This is the way to go about with your children and how you raise them when they come out. But you know, he actually, this was his child from his first marriage and he got divorced years ago. What they don't tell you is that that mother is fighting like because she's trying to save her son. What can she do in this world when he's rich? He's a celebrity. You might not have heard this story, but it's the same story, but it's flipped. There's a father that is fighting to stop his ex-wife from changing his son to a girl. You can't tell me that these culture wars have nothing to do with us, the church. They're not only affecting the world, but they are permeating inside the body of Christ. But let me let you in on a little secret that the world doesn't want you to. You know what the best predictor against all of this insanity that I just described? Child poverty, physical problems, mental health problems, crime, drug use, being on medication. They just medicate everybody for everything. You watch the TV, you can't go by five minutes without seeing pharmacy, or not pharmacy, but big pharma, advertising their product and then letting you know all the adverse things that could happen by using our product. They medicate everyone. Suicide rose because of the COVID lockdown. What's the best predictor against all of that? A healthy family comprising of one man and one woman together. That right there is the best thing to protect your children. Is it 100% pure? No, we're in a fallen world. But it's so much better than this redefinition that has been happening over the last eight years in our families. Because when they redefined marriage, they also tried to redefine family. We just didn't realize it at the time, unless we were paying attention, that they're really redefining families. 
So over the last 50 years, I've, I've paid attention. I've been real. I wasn't born, you know, for the last 50 years. But I pay attention as I look back that in our country and in the world, progressively, we have stopped rewarding families that are like this one that I just described. We don't reward them. We tell, uh, we tell, or the government tells, don't get back with your husband. We'll give you money. We'll give you welfare. We'll give you Section 8. We'll give you the food stamps. Don't just don't do that. That's really what they're saying. They don't come out and say that, obviously. But that's exactly what they're doing. And so the family stays separated because there's no, uh, uh, there's no, I think you guys know what I'm talking about because I can't figure out the word right now. There's no incentive. That's the word. Boom. Incentive. There's no incentive. They're not giving an incentive. And they should. Because what I don't understand is that families, strong families with the father and the mother working together for the benefit of not only their family, but their legacy, their descendants, when they are are, are at strongest, it actually benefits our communities. It benefits our nation. It benefits our society as a whole. But they're not incentivizing it. They want a redefinition, and that redefinition, we're seeing the fruit of it. It's tearing down our nation. Not that I'm here to prop up our nation, but I'm saying it's tearing down families. And I'm sighing, and I'm asking my God, why? Why is there a woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who is asking for prayer, for her sweet daughter. She's rejected her Christian upbringing. She's decided that her personal pronouns are they and them. She says she's broken our hearts. We're shattered for her. We cry often. I was a single mom, she says. I sacrificed all for her to go to a good private Christian K-12 school. You think it's not affecting the church? It's right there, if not at our doorstep, it's coming in. Why are drag queens parading in front of our children as young as two within public schools and libraries? And they've actually been identified previously as pedophiles. Why are parents more regularly having their children undergoing transgender surgeries? to chop off healthy members of their own body. Why are our children being unendated with what I refer to as the alphabet mafia? Why are they being unendated with their teachings in our schools? It's being directly pushed on children in public schools as early as preschool and kindergarten. Why? Why are college campuses remove no 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 why are college campuses promoting tolerance and acceptance listen to the word minor attracted persons stop stop and think about that minor okay we're talking about kids attracted kids that are wait you're talking about people that are attracted to minors They're calling it MAPS now in our colleges and universities. Step back. What are they promoting? Pedophilia. That has been taboo since the beginning of time. That has been unacceptable. And yet it's taught in our colleges and universities. Don't believe me. Look it up. I don't. Check me. I I don't care. Check me. Check the information. Don't take my word for it. So think about what were the long-term consequences of abortion from 1973? 63 and a half million lives were legally murdered. And families were not grown over all of those years. Families have been beaten and battered and broken because of abortion. 
What were the long-term consequences of prayer in public schools? Anybody taught in public schools? You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know the struggle. There is a moral, spiritual wickedness and sickness in our society, and it's found in the hearts of men. Not the government, not, not the legislature. No, men. It's in the hearts of men. That's why the Supreme Court could turn around something and overturn it, and yet you have a whole state wanting to legislate abortion legalized in their state up to the way of birth because there's a spiritual wickedness in the heart of man. And the promulgation of all of these issues that I've just mentioned, at its essence, at its core, it's demonic, it's evil, it's wicked, and it's satanic. Let me narrow the focus a little bit. We, we all can see what I'm talking about. We all see it. We're all affected by it. I'm sure that there are families here that are affected by that. All of these issues are working together in tandem to dissolve marriages, to dissolve families. They're redefining them. They're destroying just fellowship with one another common everyday fellowship with our neighbors because a certain neighbor put a flag of something that they were you know vouching for now their neighbor doesn't no that's not my friend anymore just because they put a certain kind of flag that promoted a certain kind of thing you know what I'm talking about politically but all of this is working toward the acceptance of a godless society a society that does not fear God anymore they want to take out the word God out of the Pledge of Allegiance. There's a woman, I don't know if you know her, her name is Joni Erickson Tada. She's a, uh, she, she was crippled due to, I forgot what exactly. Sorry? Diving accident, that's right, that's right. She dived into an accident and she became, I think it was paraplegic or something. She said this, gradually, though no one remembers exactly how it happened, the unthinkable becomes tolerable, and then acceptable, and then legal, and then <laughs> applaudable. Wow, great job for you to come out of the closet. Good for you. Wow, you're saying that, that you were just um, um, designated a, a, a male at birth, but you're saying now that you're a female. Good for you. You see, on a secular level, everything, everything, everything I mentioned is aimed at the family. It's especially aimed at families that abide in Christian principles and values. Families who are, are trying to properly apply the word of God to their lives and to each other. Why? You know, that's the infamous question of, of Pastor Joe. Why? And then he goes and answers, why? Let me tell you. Because families are the foundational building block of all societies. They're the foundational building block of all societies. As the family goes, so does the nation. If you have a nation full of broken, broken, destroyed families, you will have a weak nation that will be conquered in a jiffy. But see, on a spiritual level, it works the same way. As individuals and families grow up and mature in the Lord, so does the body of Christ. The enemy knows that. He knows that the stronger God's children are in families, the stronger they're going to be in Christ Jesus. You know, they say there's a separation of church and state in, in our world. And, and I look back to the founding fathers of this country 
And I don't see that they did not want the state to influence the church. That's what they didn't want. They didn't want the state telling the church because they were about religious liberties. They wanted the church to influence what's going on as their government or state, the nation, progresses. That's what they wanted. Because, and the reason why I know this is because when you look at the Constitution, you look at, well, it started with the Articles of Confederation, but then it goes to the Constitution and you go into the Bill of Rights, you know, the amendments. Where did they get those ideas from? You think they came up with that themselves? They got it from Judeo-Christian principles. Jewish, Christian, Old Testament, New Testament values. That's where they got them from. And they're all founded in the word of God. So I want you to consider something. If you go to Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 34 to 36, Jesus says something very, very interesting. He said, don't you think that I came to bring peace on the earth? I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own house. Oh. Hmm. He's using all of these fights, these battles, these wars that I've just spoken about to find out who will stand with him. Who will stand with him? If you've heard anything about the remnant, the remnant of the church is going to be pulled out. It's, it's, it's a remnant refining process. He is letting all of these things, he, the Lord, is letting all of these things rise up because he is exposing who is actually with him. What do you think Jesus meant when he said, be the light? Don't hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. What do you think he meant when he said, you need to be the salt of the earth. And if you lose your savor, then you're not worth brilliant, my much. Hear. What did Jesus mean? Hear what the Spirit is saying. Come out and be separate. Come out of her, my people. Come out. And so when Isaiah, there's that warning in chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. There are battles in so many different levels uh, of, of, and corners of our society. And listen, they need to be fought. There are economic battles. They need to be fought or they're going to rob us blind. There are political battles. They need to be fought. Whether you like this side or you like the other side, it needs to be fought. Social battles need to be fought. There's battles in the entertainment, in the music, in the media, in the religious industry. But what I want to say to you today that our nation needs a fresh wind of grace. It needs the spirit of the Lord. I've been crying that the spirit of the Lord would just flood our nation. Because that's going to bring about revival. We talk about revival, revival, revival. But talk to me about repentance, repentance, repentance. Because it's the spirit of the Lord that works in the heart of man to repent from all of these wicked ways. And there's only a certain type of people that can fight the actual spiritual battle that needs to be fought. And that's the brothers and sisters that are in the body of Christ. We're the only ones that can do it because the world is not going to fight the spiritual battle for us. We have to. We're the only ones that can. And what I want to say today is we can't effectively change the world if we can't change what's going on in our own house. 
if we are fighting battles in our own house and losing, what are we going to do when we fight against the world? We can't fight a battle that needs to be fought if our own house is not in order. How many of you heard it said that the divorce rate of the world is nearly the same as the divorce rate for those who profess to be Christian? They're both 50%. They're both 50%. There's a nuance to that that's very, it's, it's rarely ever spoken of. But it's this. Those that are really not just profess to be Christian. I, I came from Miami. We came to the, to the south in Georgia, and everybody said they were Christian, and then you realize... Okay, so there's a difference between those who profess to be Christian, but they're a part of these surveys. But here's the deal. Here's the nuance. If you are firmly committed to the Lord and his ways, then the divorce rate is significantly less for you. But they don't tell you that because they want to make it look like, oh, it doesn't matter whether you're married or in Christ or married without Christ, it doesn't make a difference. They're both 50% anyway. It's a lie. It's a lie for those that are truly committed, that truly love the Lord. That happens far, far less. Not perfect. We live in a fallen world. There's still some carnality, but not like what they're saying. Ephesians 6, 12 says, for we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness and wicked spirit in high places. And it is through prayer and our consecration to the Lord with our lives that we fight these unseen spiritual forces. Let me narrow the focus a little bit more again started broadly about things that are going on in the world and the nation, and then I started honing in on the families, and I want to hone in a little bit more about what's going on in, in our families and in our nation. But if, you, if you've ever read Psalm 109, David is, is, is praying against his enemies. And he says, they have rewarded me evil for good, hatred for my love. So he's praying They've done me ill. They've done me wrong. And so David says, set a wicked man over him. Who? His enemies. Set a wicked man over him. If my enemy's here, let him have someone that's standing at his right side, which would be this side for you guys, standing at his right side that would accuse him. When he is judged by enemy, let him be found guilty. And let his prayer become a sin. Let his days be few. Let another take his office. But here's the kicker, verse 9 and 10. Let his children be fatherless. That's a revelation if you were not aware. Let his wife be a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg and let them seek their bread and also from definite places. So David understood which is another scripture that I believe Jesus spoke about, that you can't take the house unless you take out who? The strong man. Who's the strong man in families? That's the father. Take him out and you can vanquish the enemy before you. David understood that. The problem is that curse that he was speaking of it's running amok in our nation. Isaiah chapter 3 and several different verses, uh, 4, 5, 8, 11, and 12. The Spirit of the Lord is talking about his people. He says, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Do we not see that in this age? Children are running the house. What? The people will be oppressed, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. And the child will be insolent toward the elder and base toward the honorable. In other words, they're going to be disrespectful. They're going to be dishonorable to anyone that's an elder, including their parents. 
For Jerusalem is ruined. Judah is fallen. Why? Got that? Why? Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. They have, they have turned away from the Lord their God, their heavenly Father. To provoke the eyes of his glory. But you go to verse 11. Woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with him for the reward of his hand shall be given. As for my people. Children are their oppressors. And women rule over them. Full stop. You guys know what the matriarchy is? You guys know what the patriarchy is? Has it not been flipped? In so many families, it has been flipped. And yet, this was the curse. This was the consequence of the people of God. Children will oppress them. And then women will rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you, cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. Paul spoke to Timothy of the last days in 2 Timothy. He described it in this fashion. He said, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves, selfish, prideful, not thinking about their wives or their children, thinking about themselves and themselves only. They'll love the money. They'll be boasting. They'll be proud. They'll be blaspheming. They'll be disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they'll have a form of godliness. That's what's so deceptive about it. They'll have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power thereof. So some such people turn away. Don't hang out with them. I said, Lord, then what's the answer? And he reminded me of the spirit of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah came to restore the hearts of the children to their fathers. It was first spoken of in Malachi, the last chapter of the Old Covenant. He said, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what will he do? He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Now, without any revelation, you're just going to think, oh, he's going to restore families. They're, they're young children to the fathers and the father's hearts to the children. That's what you would think. I, I would think the same way. But when Jesus spoke about it, listen to what he says. In Luke 1, chapter 16 and 17, it says, and he will turn, speaking of the spirit of Elijah, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. It was about him returning the hearts of his children back to him. And he in turn returning back to them in restoration, in reconciliation. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. In other words, I'm taking this interpretation, who's writing this in Luke, I'm taking it from Malachi. But what does it mean that he's going to turn the children of Israel back to the Lord their God? That's what that was about. And right now the hearts of the people in this nation, especially in the church, need restoration. We need to return back to our Father. It says, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Let me narrow it down again. We went broad, we went to families, we went to this curse, and now I want to pinpoint something. And I've mentioned this somebody in different times, but 
If we go back to the Garden of Eden, in chapter 2, it tells us that Adam was created, was formed out of the dust of the ground and was breathed into him the breath of life. In chapter 2, it says that he was given the great commission. He was given the responsibility to take dominion over the earth. He. I'm stressing that because in chapter 2, there was no Eve yet. He was given the responsibility to take dominion, to name all the cattle, and to take dominion over the earth, over everything that was created. And, and, and the Lord said before he started naming all of the different uh, animals, he said, it's not good that he should be alone. I'm going to make one suitable for him. But he went out and he named all the animals and he found that none were suitable for him. That's when he was put to sleep. And when he was put to sleep, that's when the Lord brought forth uh, from, from his rib the woman, Ish and Ishi. The reason why I'm pointing this out is because the commandment of responsibility was given to the man, the father, if you will. And the enemy did not come against the strong man, did he? No. In the very next chapter, we read how the serpent came and beguiled Eve. He began to speak with Eve and exchange with Eve and, and cause her to question what was said by the Lord. But I want you to think about, you know, when we go back to chapter 2, it was to Adam that he told him, you can have everything you want. You can eat for whatever tree you want, but this tree, don't eat of it because the day you eat it, you shall surely die. It was given to the man. So why is the serpent going to Eve? Eve must have known what the Lord said. How? Because her husband, Adam, told her. So the serpent begins to discuss with Eve, and, and they go back and forth, and they exchange. And in verse 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her. And he ate. And it was then that they saw and fell. When the man ate is when their eyes were open and they saw that they now were fallen. But he was with her. Do you understand that? He was with her the whole time. And he said nothing. Why do you think that the enemy through the media and everything we've just spoken about previously wants to silence and shut up the man? He's the one in authority. If anyone is to be speaking out against all of this insanity, it should be the man. I don't mind mama bears coming into the school uh, educational board of education and, and, and rile up and they say, no, we're not having this, we're not having this. And I've seen so many mama bears do that. But where's the fathers? I've seen some. Don't get me wrong. But they should be the ones standing right there. They should be the ones standing right there and saying, no, this is not happening in my house. I'm not tolerating this. This is not coming in here. Because I'm not going to stay silent. Silence is how he gets one over on us. Think about Lot. Lot was in, 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 in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was vexed with the filthy conversation and all the things that they were doing. Why? Why? didn't seem like he was saying anything. He just stayed quiet. And he 
took the burden as if that's what he should have done. He had Abraham. He could have gone back. Hey, Abraham, this place is going nuts. I'm getting out of here. He never did that. Remember, Lot was about to give his own daughters to the men. So when he spoke up, he seemed, uh, he seemed kind of weak, don't you think? So we go back to Genesis in chapter 3, and we know how he dealt with the serpent. He dealt with the woman. And then he dealt with the man. And remember what the man said. The woman whom you gave me is your fault. The woman who you gave me, she did. Well, when the consequences came down, he said to the man in verse 17, then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Oh, man, that's incriminating. That's such an indictment. Because he heard the voice of the Lord directly. Thou shalt eat of every tree that you want, Adam, just not that one. And instead, you heeded the voice of your wife. And you ate of the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. And then you had the curses. And this is why the Lord sent them out of the garden. So we realize from Romans that because of this one act of, of, of disobedience, death reigned and has been reigning since the Garden of Eden. But much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness that will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So there is still hope even though this has happened in Romans 5. But the garden relationship was gone. The heart of Adam had been severed, had been cut from his father, his heavenly father, due to the effects and the consequences of his own sin. This family that, this family of God that God created, because God created this, this Adam and this Eve, this man and this woman, that was the first family. He created them. He blessed them. He ordained them. And they had been broken because of their sin. I've shared a lot. I hope I haven't overwhelmed you. But I've had on my heart, honestly, for many, many months now, to share a story with. It's written by a man named Dennis Jernigan. He was a man that was caught up in sin for probably the first 20 years of his life. And God delivered him. God rescued him in a mighty way. He's got a powerful, powerful, mighty testimony. He ended up getting married. He ended up having lots of kids. He had like nine kids. And then, then eventually over time he had nine grandchildren. But while he had, was having his kids... He felt and he received the song from the Lord to be able to communicate to his own children what the Lord had done for him. Because what he did in coming out the way that he did and, 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 and exposing himself publicly so that he could give glory to the Lord about how he was redeemed, if you understood his story like I do, you would understand why I think he's like a spiritual giant to me in the faith. Because he was so brave, he was so courageous at a time where you would not think of coming out and declaring that this is what I was a part of, but this is what the Lord saved me from. And the testimony of Jesus, it's a spirit of prophecy for others. And so he wrote this song because he wanted to communicate to his young children in a way that they might be able to understand what the Lord did for him. It speaks of the plight of the life of, of the Israelites from Egypt through the wilderness into Canaan land and then back into the Babylonian captivity all the way unto the days of his flesh. It speaks of the prodigal son. It speaks of all of mankind's plight as sinners. It speaks to us all personally of our plight in life. 
how we have fallen short and fallen from grace and how we have been redeemed. You know, you might have noticed that all the kids came in. I requested that because this story can reach them at their level. But I guarantee you that if you hear our Father's heart, you're going to realize it's speaking directly to you. And so if you would just open your heart to the words of this story that I want to share with you, I'm praying that you will be blessed and then we'll close out. father very gently cradled his son in his arms. The little boy loved the way his father held him because he held him a lot. And sometimes the father would sing to him while he held him. In fact, more often than not, the father would sing the boy right this. But sometimes the boy would seek back to his father in his own simple way. And if you listened very closely, you could hear them both sing. You see, they loved one another very much. And they loved to sing their love to one another. The father being a good father, loved his son more than any father had ever loved a child. More than the boy loved him. And the father's song was always sweet and tender. It was never forceful. It's never harsh. I'll have no other, for I love you only. I'll never forsake you or leave you alone. I love. the father would call to his son. Son, come walk with me in the cool of the evening. And the boy would run gladly from wherever he was for he loved these walks because they were so peaceful, so refreshing. And because he knew that if he walked 
far enough, long enough, his daddy would pick him up and hold him in his arms and carry him home, singing all the while. I'll have no other, for I love you only. I'll never forsake you or leave you alone. And even though the boy always fell asleep in his daddy's arms, his heart still kept singing. Now, the father loved to give good gifts to his son. He wanted nothing but the best for him. Not only did he provide for the boy's every need, he also clothed them with the finest of clothes. You see, the father wanted everyone to know that his, this was his son, whom he loved very dearly. And every day was like this, joy and peace, for the father lived to lavish his love upon his son. And the son was consumed in his father's love for him. Till one day, the boy met a stranger, a very beautiful stranger, a man more handsome than any he had ever known, except for his father. And the stranger spoke in lovely tones and much like his father. Why, he even sounded much like his father with a sing-song lilt to his voice. And he told the boy of others who wanted to walk with him, just like his daddy. All he would have to do is love these other new friends and sing their new songs. Now the boy thought for a moment. Hmm, it sounded good to him. Because if one love is so good, well, more loves could only be better. After all, it was about time he started making some decisions on his own. So he decided that he would choose to walk with others. And he walked away. And as he did, he heard his father calling out in the cool of the evening, Son, Come walk with me. I'm here. And he sang for his son. I'll have no other, for I love you only. I'll never forsake you or leave you. Then he waited. But the boy hid, for he had sung his love to another. And even as he sang the sweet song of his new friend, he realized he had been deceived. He realized he had given his heart to another, something he knew his daddy would never do. How could he ever face his father again? He felt so dirty. He felt so unworthy of his father's love. And the song that had once brought so much joy to his heart, it made him want to run away. And still, his daddy called for him. My precious, I know you are hurting, and though you have left me, I welcome you home. And his father picked him up, picked up his little boy, and he calmed his fears, and he 
he, he dried his eyes and, and he washed him clean as he held him close to his heart. Closer than he had ever held him before. Then he sang to his son, reassurance. I'll have no other for I love you only. I'll never forsake you or leave you alone. Even though the son felt his father's love, it wasn't the same the same as before and it would never be the same again at least so he thought and even though the father loved him the son somehow couldn't quite hear him as he did before but you see when you give his love to another his ears became closed to any but the one that he gave his love to so even though the father loved him more dearly than he did before, the son, he just couldn't quite hear it, couldn't quite believe it. And still the father sang to him, I love you. Oh, how I After day, father called to his boy. But day after day, the boy walked further and further away, and he began to give his love to others again. Because he still had an empty place in his heart where once his father had loved him, and an empty place that longed to be filled. But since he found it harder and harder to hear his father's voice, he began listening to the voice of others, of other strangers again. And he would even sing his love back to any stranger who would listen to him. For you see, the boy was a little boy in need. And little boys need their daddy. And if they don't come when their daddy calls, they become hopelessly lost, desperately lost, afraid and ashamed, hurt and dirty, sick and dying, alone, dark. And every one of those other voices that he gave his love to every one of them stopped singing back to him. In fact, their love songs had turned to screams and, and hate and lies, and their tender hugs were no, no longer gentle like his daddy's had been. They hurt now. In fact, their arms felt more like ropes of iron and chains of steel than arms of love. One day, he realized that he was trapped within his perspective, no way out. And he realized that there was only one who had ever really loved him. That was his daddy. If only his daddy could hear him now, if only he were here. And he cried, Daddy, so dear, I'm all alone. I am afraid and I want to come home. He 
waited. How could his father ever love them after what he had done? And then his ears, they heard an old familiar tune. Heard an old familiar voice. And his heart felt an old familiar warmth. And his daddy picked him up and held the boy in his arms in that old familiar embrace. And his daddy sang to him, I love you. he held him close and as he held the boy he did a strange thing he began to take off the chains and the ropes one by one he was humming his love to the boy all the while boy had ever known. He untied the knots of despair. He untied the hopelessness, every one of them. He even cut away the hurt and the pain that the boy had inflicted upon others, along with every harsh word, vile thought, or bitter deed he had ever done. And he broke off the hardness of his heart that had been built up by the boy's own doubt and pride. And he dried away every tear and he took away the boy's own deep pain and rejection as he washed away the dirt and the filth the son had been clothed with for many years now. And then the father did an even stranger thing. He placed upon himself all of the ropes, all of the chains. Every punishment that the boy deserved as a consequences of his own failures. And the boy, he, he was overcome with joy. He was overcome with peace. But soon, it turned to grief. When he had realized what he had done to his daddy, for you see all the weight of all of those things which had so burdened the boy that had broken the heart of his father, <laughs> placed upon him. See, the father loved his son. He loved him so much that he was willing to die for his child. And while the weight of sin choked the life out of him, the father still managed to sing the song with his dying breath. I'll have no one. For I love you only I'll never forsake you Or leave you alone At 
and the boy just sat there. He was empty. He was alone. He was stunned. He was in awe by such a precious love. And he waited. Because he knew. He didn't hear those other voices. They were gone now. All he could hear was his daddy song. The memory of that final refrain playing over and over again and again in his ears. And then after a while, he slept. He slept the soundest sleep he had ever known. Since the last time he walked with his father in the cool of the evening. And as he slept, something wonderful began to take place. He began to hear his song, the song that he used to sing to him. And after a while, he even thought he could see his daddy's face. He, he, he was almost sure he could feel his father's gentle embrace and, 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 and feel that placing that special robe of white upon him. And over this all that coat of so many wonderful colors which had been a sign of his daddy's deep love for him. And then he felt a warmth so great that it could only be the arms of his precious father holding him close and then the boy realized the truth. His daddy was here. He was alive. And this was no dream, even though he was at complete rest. His daddy loved him. No matter what, of this he was sure now, more than ever. The little boy held his daddy close. Because he knew now there was nothing that could ever separate him from his father's love ever again. So they held each other and they sang this song. I'll have no other for I love you only. I'll never forsake you. Oh, leave you alone. I love you. Oh, how I love you. I love you. there's any man in this house any male in this house I challenge you to stand right where you're at stand up specifically speaking to the men because if we're going to have a godly impact on this world we got to have a house in order 
In order to have our house in order, individually, every one of you that is standing here needs to be reconciled and restored to our Heavenly Father. And when that happens, we can minister the love of Christ to our wives and minister the Father's love to our children. You see, our family is akin to Jerusalem. You remember Jerusalem, Judea, Sumeria, to the other most parts of the earth. Our family is Jerusalem. It was a Snoopy cartoon. And Charlie Brown was saying to Snoopy, his dog right beside him, he said, Snoopy, many folks are praying for God to heal a lamb. But I think he's still waiting for people to humble themselves, repent, and turn from their wicked ways. He said, amen. You see, brothers, when our house is stable, we can more effectively spread the anointing of God that he has placed on us as the head of the home. And when we can function and, and, and flow in the anointing that God has placed upon our home, we can more effectively reach out to our community, reach out to our neighborhoods, reach out in our workplace, reach out into our cities, in our state, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Man, we need to take full responsibility for ourselves, our families, including our wives and our children. And the only way to adequately do that is to consecrate ourselves to the Lord. Consecrate ourselves to his word, to his will, to his works, to his ways. We need to fear him more than any man. heard the word of God today that you come forward to this altar because I would like to just pray over you. Every man, please, if you will come, I compel you to come and demonstrate your faith by just simply coming forward. thing I want you to know is that you are not alone. There's others in your same position. There's others with the same anointing. The anointing that God has placed specifically on man. And though our times are going to get tough, know that you're not alone. Jesus, as you have desired, I present these mighty men of valor to you in dedication and consecration. To what? To be the leader. Under the covering and the direct leadership of you, Lord Jesus. We consecrate ourselves that we would seek out a deeper, more intimate walk with you, our Heavenly Father. We consecrate ourselves to, to grow in knowledge, to understand God's word as we learn to hear his voice and obey. We consecrate ourselves to stand and not be silent. We consecrate ourselves to not compromise, to not bend the knee to the spirit of this age. God, as we draw nigh unto you, draw nigh unto us. 
We may have this masculine bravado, this macho-ness that says that we don't need much of anything, that we can handle it alone. But Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves right now in your presence, declaring that we need you. Restore us, Lord. Heal the broken heart. Heal the wounds that have been inflicted on us by your enemy in times past. God, we cry out to you. We need you, Jesus. Every man up here needs you, Jesus. And we're not going to be ashamed. We're not going to be afraid. We're going to be transparent. And let one another know that we need Jesus at all times. In our weakness, in our despair, in our doubt, we need you, Jesus.